Hello and welcome to another episode of The Real Deal. I'm Stephanie Bristow. We're glad you could join us. On tonight's show, we discuss the career of one former Mouseketeer, a scary movie to get you in the mood for Halloween, and of course, the latest and greatest in Hollywood. Speaking of which, here's Claudia Johnson with Hollywood Headlines. Claudia? Thanks, Stephanie. Netflix has officially banned its plans to spin off its DVD delivery service option into a new service called Quickster. Netflix announced its original intentions to separate their online streaming and DVD by mail services on September 18th and has received a criticism from customers ever since. Netflix stock even started to slide after the original announcement. Chief Executive Reed Hastings stated that Netflix axed Quickster after realizing that the company was moving too fast and their customers value simplicity. A Michigan woman is suing movie distributor Film District after its movie Drive, starring Ryan Gosling, failed to meet her expectations. The woman, Sarah Deming, claims that the movie's trailer led her to believe that the film would be more like The Fast and the Furious. In an effort to seem not so ridiculous, she also claims that the film promotes anti-Semitism to a dangerous degree. In addition to demanding a full refund from the film district, Deming intends to upgrade her case from an individual lawsuit to a class action suit in an attempt to stop misleading trailers from being distributed. We'll probably hear from her again soon when she finds out that this month's Three Musketeers is really about four men. And finally, congratulations to Shirley MacLaine, who will be the recipient of the American Film Institute's 40th Life Achievement Award. MacLaine is, fitting, is a fitting choice because not only has she been in the film industry for 56 years, she has also worked along several of Hollywood's biggest legends, including Jack Lemmon, Frank Sinatra, and Billy Wilder. And she's been nominated for six Oscar winning, for six Oscars, winning Best Actress in 1984 for Terms of Endearment. McLean will receive the award on June 7th, and TV Land will broadcast the ceremony later that month. Past recipients include Steven Spielberg, Meryl Streep, Gene Kelly, and last year's honoree, Morgan Freeman. That's what's happening in Hollywood. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Claudia. Next, let's find out what's currently happening in the music industry. Here's Brittany Knox with the Music Minute. Brittany? Thanks, Stephanie. Executives at RCA have officially decided to shut down three of their music labels, Jive, Arista, and J Records. Artists currently signed to those labels will be folded into a RCA Records lineup. These artists include Britney Spears, Alicia Keys, Usher, Pink, and Pitbull. RCA states that they made this decision with the full support of their artists and that they simply wanted to refresh the RCA brand. Former member of the Jonas Brothers, Joe Jonas, released his solo album, Fast Life, yesterday. His past music is classified as pop, but Fast Life is most definitely a mixture of pop, hip-hop, and R&B. For this album, Joe Jonas has been working with Claude Kelly, a famous songwriter in New York City. Kelly describes Joe's music as edgy, urban pop, where he can showcase his voice in a way people haven't ever heard him before. It'll be interesting to see how Jonas Brothers fans react to the solo album and the different types, types of fans so Jonas will pick up on his new solo journey. Country duo Sugarland, who were scheduled to perform at the Indiana State Fair minutes before the tragic stage collapse, will return to the Hoosier State and perform a free concert for those who were present at the fair that night. The concert will take place at Consego Fieldhouse on October 28th, and the donations to the to the Indiana State Fair Remembrance Fund will be accepted throughout the night. That's it for the Music Minute. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Brittany. Coming up after the break, Ben Rocky gives his two cents about the most recent issue plaguing the film industry. Stick around. A tumor? Yes. Me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that doesn't make any sense, though. I mean, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I, you know. I recycle. We want you at first base. I've only ever played catcher. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell him, watch. It's incredibly hard. Every aquarium in the country says it's hopeless. Well, they haven't met winter yet. You're my brain trust. So how are we doing? What do you think, Stevie? I think it's ours for the taking. You were working for the wrong man. I want you to work for us. This is what it's all about! Let's make some money! Welcome back. In most industries, the constant change of technology creates a divide between the old schoolers and the techies. The film industry is no different. 
Here to school us in Film 101 is Ben Rocky. Thanks, Stephanie. One of the biggest and most obnoxious debates currently raging in the film industry is film versus digital. But what side has the better argument? I'm here to tell you that it's neither. Let's start off with the pros of film. 35 millimeter film has been the industry standard for, well, a really long time. It's a manageable size for film stock and can capture beautiful images. Film purists tout its organic look, and they also will incorrectly discuss resolution. To keep things simple, we see in lines, not pixels. Think of why we say 1080p and not 1920p for TV resolution. The difference between the amount of lines from a fully processed film, what we see in the theater, and a digital projection is not great, and either can actually display better. It depends on the processing and the projector being used. If someone says they can tell a difference between the two, they are lying, and you should call them on it. Film's most significant con is that it's pricey. Just the cameras alone are very expensive. But when getting another take means real dollars being spent on a film, independent filmmakers are really hurt. And that's not even mentioning the expense of developing, processing, and eventually digitizing the film. Digital filmmaking has increased dramatically over the past few years. More affordable cameras have allowed resurgence in low-budget independent filmmaking. Film stock is expensive to purchase and to develop, but now filmmakers can switch out cards or hard drives and keep shooting without anyone having to run the film to be processed. The latest editions of the digital camera powerhouses produce images four or five thousand pixels high. That is incredible! As digital cameras become more advanced and capture ever higher resolution, digital's largest flaw is revealed. Such high quality images create a lot of digital information, which must be offloaded and stored somewhere. We are talking hundreds. Of, GB, uh, of GBs a day per camera. A, a laptop for dumping footage is no longer enough. Now state-of-the-art data rigs are becoming a standard addition to digital shoots. When their rental cost compares to that of the high-end cameras themselves, producers have a lot to think about. At the end of the day, the visual difference is not that big. What matters more is what fits the film being made. The most important element is the story. No camera will make a bad story compelling. Now, now, you should know enough to stop people from arguing that one side is correct. Film is still the standard for large Hollywood productions, but digital is gaining a lot of ground. Both will be used for years to come. So leave the debate to those that it matters most to, the folks deciding what camera is best for the movie. That's it for the first Film 101 lesson. Until next time, you keep studying. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Ben. Up next, we have Hit or Miss with Ben and Andrew, as well as Aaron Cromer's profile of a talented actor with a booming career. You won't want to miss this. Ben Kramer and Andrew Bennett are here to discuss their take on a recent theatrical release that's currently receiving a lot of Oscar buzz. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Stephanie. And thank you all for tuning in to another segment of Hit or Miss with Ben and Andrew. I'm Andrew. And I'm Ben. And today we are going to review the movie Drive, starring Ryan Gosling and directed by Nicholas Reffin. Ryan Gosling stars as an L.A. wheelman for hire who stunt drives for movies during the day and steers getaway vehicles for armed heists at night. After one of his heists goes terribly wrong, he must defend the woman he loves and her son from a gang of ruthless uh, thugs. So what do you think what about do this you movie? Do? Then? A drive? I, I really enjoyed this film, Andrew, and there's a lot to talk about it that made this movie stand out. And what I mean by stand out is that this wasn't your typical action movie. Um, with a title like Drive, you'd think that the majority of the action would just involve car chases. Yeah, I thought the same thing, Ben, but this movie actually really surprised me. Um, you know, and, and in a good way. Um, the, it's all about its pacing and how it develops the tension for the audience, really. Mm -hmm. um, the beginning of the movie, you see Ryan Gosling at his most cool and precise as he's evading the police and getting jobs done for his clients. The first 30 minutes of this movie are very smooth 
and um, there's really not that much dialogue in it. And then all of a sudden it hits you with a ton of violence, some actually disturbing violence yeah. that I really just wasn't expecting from this movie at all. The violence is so unexpected for yeah. me as well, and the violence that he just erupts from Ryan Gosling's character uh, like contradicts like and contrasts his uh, quiet and like sometimes awkward demeanor in the first half of the film that you know it made the movie work and like even his facial expressions and like hardly any dialogue uh, made his character sort of unreadable and mysterious but I think his performance was terrific. Yeah I really liked his performance and you know with Ryan Gosling you know he can do so much with just a glance of his eyes that a lot of actors can't do with even a monologue um, but th he's not the only actor to praise in this film. Albert Brooks and Ron Perlman play some of the creepiest villains I've actually seen on film. And if you know Albert Brooks, he's actually known for his achievements as a comedic actor. Here he takes on a full embodiment of evil, especially in some scenes uh, relatively cringeworthy involving a fork, a knife, and even an antique razor blade. Ooh, yeah, and Carrie Mulligan plays a very understated but authentic role as the woman torn between love and duty mm -hmm. with Ryan Gosling. Her romance is what I think really anchored this film. I agree, and also let's not forget Brian Cranston, who you should know from Breaking Bad. Yep. He plays Ryan Gosling's mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, he plays. He does a really great job, and um, it's really an understated role. Uh, he, he really has... He's got a lot of flaws. But yeah, yes, he does have a lot of flaws, yeah. but he, he's such a likable character, and he plays it as such a down-to-earth guy. You can't help but really like the guy. Yeah, so. and also did we mention that Ryan Gosling's name isn't even mentioned in the movie. No. <laughs> you just, we just simply refer to him as Driver. He's the driver, um, which is kind of weird, but I actually kind of liked it. It added some mystery and intrigue to his character, so I think I actually like that about the film. Yeah, so all in all, we would say that Drive is a stylish, violent, and unique film that hopefully is appreciated by all audiences. Yeah, I hope so. I think it's safe to say that we both give this film a hit. A hit. So this has been Hit or Miss with Ben and Andrew. Now go drive to the nearest theater. Check out Drive. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, guys. It's impressive enough when an actor is able to transcend from child star to Hollywood headliner, but when they also become a fixture in some of the most popular movies in theaters, you have to wonder, is there anything they can't do? Here to review Ryan Gosling's rise to fame is Aaron Cromer. Aaron? When you think of Ryan Gosling, you probably think of his role in The Notebook, his recent releases, or his intense indie roles to date. What might surprise some of you, depending on your age, is that Ryan began his career as a young child star in the Mickey Mouse Club alongside Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears. But unlike his pop counterparts, Gosling has taken the route of serious acting roles, beginning in 2001 with The Believer, which won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance Film Festival. It was this critical career move that solidified Gosling's direction as a serious and versatile actor. In this, he played an Orthodox Jew who becomes a neo-Nazi, this heavy role is seriously impressive considering Gosling was 20 years old at the time of filming. After that, Gosling made a, himself a household name opposite Rachel McAdams in the now classic The Notebook. If you haven't seen The Notebook, it's about two star-crossed lovers, teenagers, and an older couple played by James Garner and Gina Rollins reading their story from a notebook. I've seen it a thousand times and still cannot turn away if it's on TV. Not only did Gosling deliver a wrenching performance as a heartbroken Noah, but he again stretched his range and showed us what he can do, namely play romantic parts. From then until this year, Gosling has been further perfecting his craft on intense, award-winning roles in such indie films as Lars and the Real Girl. He plays Lars, a severely socially inept man who develops a romantic relationship with an anatomically correct sex doll. His whole family in small northern towns support his attachment and go along with it, showing how much they care about him. It is through the skill of his ability that he evokes pathos for a character acting so abnormally. Ryan Gosling has continued to earn critical acclaim in such recent movies as Hef Nelson and Blue Valentine. Throughout his career and versatility, Ryan Gosling has pro proved he is more than just a mouseketeer, romantic lead, or even lead actor in recent hits. He is someone to watch, maybe the next George Clooney. He certainly got the looks. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Aaron. After our last break, we'll get you in the Halloween, Halloween spirit with this week's Best of Bracken, and I'll give my less scary final word. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. You can assume that some things will happen every year right around this time. The leaves change color, places are decorated in black and orange, and scary movies are abundant. 
Here to tell us about one scary movie at Bracton is Ryan Sexton. Ryan? This week I've decided to choose a film more in line with the upcoming holiday. This is the story of a young college student desperate to get away from her slob of a roommate and to find the perfect apartment. Only trouble is, she has no job. She decides to answer a babysitter wanted posting, but upon arriving to a creepy mansion, she discovers all is not what it seems. She quickly negotiates for more money, but will the price she ultimately pays be worth the price she asked for? That's the basic premise of this week's Best of Bracken, the 2009 throwback, The House of the Devil. This feature was made to represent the classic pictures, babysitters and peril pictures of the late 70s, early 80s. Director Ty West, who has directed such underground gems as The Roost and Cabin Fever 2, Spring Fever, takes great pains in emulating not only the look, but the sound of that time period, including the, fix, the fixes hit, One Thing Leads to Another on the soundtrack. There are no big name stars in the House of the Devil, unless you count E.T.'s mom, Dee Wallace, in a cameo during the opening, or Greta Gerwig, who was recently seen as the love interest to Russell Brand in the remake of Arthur out earlier this year. Here she plays the lead actress's more sensible best friend. There's, this is not, only, not a film for everyone, especially those who are not fans of the slow burn approach, but what it lacks in attention grabbing, The House of the Devil makes up for an atmosphere, something other recent scary movies have been truly lacking. And as it progresses, it ratchets up the tension to a truly rewarding, jolt-inducing finale where all is revealed. Sitting currently on Rotten Tomatoes at 86%, The House of the Devil is the perfect film to get you ready for the Halloween season, and it's currently available in Bracken. Check it out. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Ryan. Unfortunately, it's time for us to wrap things up, but I want to leave you with my final word. I want to look at my top current obsessions in entertainment, and tonight, this one's for the ladies. I could go on for hours about my favorite chick flick movies, but since we don't have that much time, let's just talk about You've Got Mail. Every time this movie comes on TV, I stop everything I'm doing and watch it. Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks give two of their best performances. The two meet in an online chat room and continue to email each other, slowly building a romance. What they don't realize is that not only do they actually know each other outside of the chat room, but they are in fact enemies. This movie was made back in the days of dial-up internet and no Facebook or Twitter, so their rom romance takes time to develop online. This is my favorite movie of all time and a must-see. Turning over to music, why not give a shout out to country music artist Taylor Swift. Although many argue her songs are too similar, I give her credit for writing and playing her own music, as well as producing all of her own music videos. Taylor has true passion and clearly knows how to sing and write to people's emotions. She's currently on tour in the United States and will start her world tour in March. And since we'll be gone for fall break next week, I wanted to remind all of our Pretty Little Liars fans to check out PLL's Halloween event on Wednesday, October 19th. The hour-long episode, entitled The First Secret, is all about the last Halloween before Allie's disappearance. The trailer looks eerie, so be ready to get spooked. And that's the end of our show this week. Be sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on all things entertainment. We'll be off for fall break, so join us again in two weeks. Same time, same place. I'm Stephanie Bristow. Have a great fall break. What was it doing to him? It's imitating his cells. I think this thing copies its prey and then hides inside it. There is going to be major fallout in a few hours. Nuclear fallout. Bird fallout. First down of the police, and I'm a full of blood. What, you can't keep up? I take my feet off the ground. I take my feet off the ground. I take my feet off the ground.